Hey everyone, uh, we're going to be starting our last story arc topic of System D today, and Nate's going to take us through the critical path of running something that we get asked for all the time, which is how do I do RC local in System D? Right, right. So everybody loves System D until the features that they liked about init D aren't there, but. Scott, I actually, you ever go to prepare for a demo and you learn something that you thought was going to be complicated is actually really simple? No, that, that never happens because I'm an expert in everything, Nate. Because you always, you always know everything? Right. Well, in this case, it turns out that it's a lot simpler than I thought. So if you go to like Google and search, how do I make RC local work again? You find all these how-tos about how to make a unit file that calls a file that's very similar to RC local. But guess what? System D has a built-in feature that makes it really simple. Surprise, right? So I'm going to show you how to use it. Um, basically, if you look at systemctl cat on rc-local, there's a service called rc-local, believe it or not. And what this is, is it's a service that gets called by another service called, it's in this description here somewhere, systemd rc local generator, right? And if you look at the note here, and I don't know how easy this is for folks to see because I'm using a local virtual machine here and I can't make the terminal any bigger, um, but it says right here, this unit gets pulled automatically into multi-user.target by systemd rc local generator if etsy rcd rc.local is executable. So if you think logically about that, all that means, all we have to do is go to etsy rc.d and there's a file here already called RC local. Let me clear the screen so you guys can see it better. And it's not executable. So out of the box on rel, it's not executable. And if you look at the file, it's got essentially nothing in it. It's got a touch on var lock subsist local, which will probably do something like tell the system that you ran an RC local at boot time. Simple enough, right? So this way you'll know if it's running RC local. So keep that in mind if you want if you care whether your systems are running this or not, this is one way you could probably check. Uh, you could probably also check for the existence of the service. But uh, all we have to do is edit the file. And we can add something in here. So we're going to add um, something really simple. We're just going to use my usual example, which is to throw the date into a file. So we're going to do echo date into temp boot. Uh, boot up, we'll call it. Okay. Now, sorry, there's no syntax highlighting. It's harder to read. Again, local virtual machine here. I'm at the console. There's no color highlighting. So if we save this, and then remember, we have to make it executable. Chmod plus x on rc.local. We do an ls-l. Now you'll see that it says it's executable. And if we reboot, What's going to happen is, first, let me show you there's no magic here. There's no file called boot up in temp at the moment. This will be easier to see, right? We're going to reboot. And what should happen is, after the system comes back up, it should run the command that I threw in there, as long as I didn't typo anything. And we should see it inside of that file that I told it to redirect the output into. So let's just give it a second. Uh, by the way, Nate, the touching of var lock subsystem local file. Um, yeah. That's been in there for a bajillion years, even when we were using init.de just to track that we had right. won the RC local. Right, right. Rebooting. Good thing this is a VM. This might be slower to reboot. OK, now we're going to log back in. I might write my name here. Remember, set short passwords for demos because long passwords make it easier to typo. And now, the moment of truth. There's boot up. Now we can see that at October 6th at 12.06, my system booted. So there we go. RC local. Simple as that. After the break, we're going to talk a little bit about how you might better uh, <laughs> implement this because this isn't necessarily the right way to do things in system D, but it is there for compatibility, which is what we wanted to show for uh, this demo. So 
All right. Uh, don't forget to like. Let me try that again. Don't forget to like and subscribe um, if you enjoy this content. Uh, so, Nate, you're talking about uh, it's there for backward compatibility, but the reason that RC Local existed just like in general was because it was pretty common to um, want to run something once at boot up. And so that was the yeah. way it always had. Um, so that I once uh, during a job interview was asked, like they, they gave me this really weird problem where like a service was starting at boot, but things weren't happening at the time that they were supposed to. And the answer was actually, let's put a thing into RC local, right? So uh, it is a nice like hacky way to work around things that aren't happening at boot the way they're supposed to. That that happened to be a workaround for a bug, which is why it was using RC local. The bug was later fixed and we took out that fix. But that was a thing they had run into and they asked me how I would have fixed it. I answered it in the same way that they fixed it, which is exactly what they wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. And so the other thing is RC local is useful for those type of local changes. Right. Right. It's something unique to this box. Um, if you were putting together something that went with a package of software that you were shipping, maybe you've packaged it as an RPM. Um, instead, you would want to create a system to unit with a run once so that it gets executed when the machine boots once. Right. Right. Uh, but that way it's portable and you can install it on multiple machines. And it'll be picked up on multiple machines. So like, yes, RC local runs at boot time, but it is a local customization for this one system. Um, so I wouldn't put like all kinds of other stuff in there. The other thing I've seen like really poor behavior over the years is you would, well, Nate, you're going to cringe at this. So uh -oh. you would like write your RPM and then in the post installation script, you'd like echo something into RC local. Um, Why not? <laughs> right. That's, that seems that's like a perfectly awful. great way to. <laughs> awful thing. Because the problem is you can't undo that easily. Right, like when somebody removes right. that RPM, how do you figure out which lines in the RC local were yours that you need to slurp back out of there when you yeah. remove RPM? Right, so managing it through a unit file um, makes it much easier because RPMs it's really easy to add a file or remove a file when you're installing or removing the package. Right, so and I would argue that. Um... I'm having trouble coming up with an example of a thing that I would rather do in RC local than just write a quick systemd unit file for, because systemd unit files are so easy to write, right? I, I get the purpose, right? Why RC local exists for local only configurations. But to be honest, through systemd timers, a cron job, like all kinds of things could be done in place of RC local. RC local has always been kind of viewed, in my eyes anyway, as like your last resort. This is this is when nothing else <laughs> will work for you. <laughs> you just put it in RC local. <laughs> so uh, I do have a quick another quick demo on how we're going to make a unit file to do something similar to what I just did in RC local, and we're also going to talk about those first boot. Uh, tasks. Although I don't have a demo for that, I'm just going to tell you exactly, you know, sort of how that works because that was a thing that I came across uh, with a customer once when I was still at TAM. So um, what we're going to do now, I've I've switched over to instruct. It should be a lot easier for folks to read. Um, but what we're going to do, there's two ways you can make a run once on boot uh, unit in systemd. One of them, if you recall, systemd run was a command line that we used when we were talking about timers. There's an on boot flag for systemd run. So what that'll do is it'll run a thing at boot time. Now, I don't have a demo of that, but I wanted to tell you that it exists because that might be a quick and easy way to get your thing done. And then it'll be a systemd timer, which is effectively the same thing. And it is a systemd unit. It's just that it's running through the timers mechanisms instead of the service mechanism. The other way is to design a systemd service. And that we're going to talk a little bit later about the differences between init D services and system D services. Um, but it's so easy to make a service. We're going to make a new service. We're going to call it onboot.service. And I'm going to copy and paste in here. 
my paste worked properly. Looks like it did. All right, so we made a unit, or we gave it a unit uh, description of my on boot task. We're going to set the type to one shot. Now, what that means is system D will not get upset at this thing if it runs and exits, because that's exactly what you would use RC local for. RC local is to call another script which runs and terminates, right? A system D one shot unit is the same thing. It will run the thing. And then if the thing exits, it won't report that it failed. It'll report success, right? If you do it as a normal, simple service, it'll say, oh no, the process crashed. Now the status is, you know, that it exited abnormally or that it exited or whatever. And that'll look different in system D than it ran and successfully exited by setting it as a one shot. All right, exec start, that's just, you know, what do we want it to run? It'll run user bin boot job. Now, in this case, you could probably put the command that you would have just dumped into RC local right here. I think it's cleaner if you make, an, uh, make a script and call the script, because then if you need to make changes, you're changing the script instead of the unit file every time you want to update it, right? So you need to make a change to what this thing does when it runs, you make the change in the script instead of making the change in the unit file. It's just cleaner and easier, I think. And then the install, you tell it where in the boot process you want it to run. In this case, it's running in multi-user target. And if you remember when we talked about targets, that's basically um, once the system is up and ready for users to log in, right? So we have that defined. Now, all you would do is copy this into cp uh, on boot dot service no, dot slash this is why you should copy and paste to etsy system d system slash and then we can do a system ctl enable on on boot dot service now you might want to call this something i don't know if there's any I didn't check to see if there was some integrated thing in system D called on boot service, but if there is, I just clobbered it. <laughs> Hopefully there's not. And that should do it. Now, I don't want to reboot the instruct system. One, because we can't see it. And two, I don't know what that's going to do to instruct. Can I reboot these things? I don't know. But that will you effectively can. do what we just did. Yeah, you we can, can reboot it. Yeah. Okay. Um, what will happen is you'll have to click that little refresh uh, right icon up there so it'll reconnect to the terminal so um let me just uh and, and Sean earlier was uh disappointed that you didn't use a system ctl reboot or sorry just yeah system ctl reboot so maybe when we reboot it that's what we use just to make sure <laughs> yeah. that Sean is satisfied all right, so what this is going to do, uh, I don't have this redirecting to a file. Maybe I'll change that quick. What this would do is that would put, put it into the system journal, which makes it harder to see. So um, change this to redirect this output, that same location and temp that we did the other one. Let's call it temp booted. This will just basically put what time and date we finish the boot up. And then if we uh, if we were to reboot, this should do the job. So okay, I'll do a system reboot. Right? This goes horribly wrong. I blame you for making me go off script. <laughs> we're actually just talking about that this week. That uh, we were. It's never good when we, when we go off script. Reboot right, it, so what can in, go wrong? It's true. Exactly. Uh, so if you click the little refreshy icon there, it should... Uh, yeah, you think it's rebooted reboot. yet? This will take a minute. Uh, it, it's pretty fast. Please wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I just like smack it again. There you go. Oh, there it is. All right, so assuming everything worked as I expected it to, we see slash... It's not there. It didn't run. Oh. I have a typo, uh, unknown key type. Oh, I know why. We 
because this has to be capital. Because system D is case sensitive. What? It doesn't like type either. What am I doing wrong here? <laughs> this shouldn't be this hard. <laughs> Does it go under service? Maybe that's why. Yes, type goes under service. Live troubleshooting. That's not what I wanted to do. Still the same as it was last time, Nate. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did the daemon reload already. I want to do status. Okay, those are the I, errors from last time. I think I did. I'll do it again just to be sure. A new error. Oh, but yeah, no new error. That's, I think, the, the key part. So if we look in temp, is it running? There. There we, we go. But now this doesn't necessarily demonstrate that it happened at boot, but you can see that when I started the service, which is what would have happened at boot, it ran once and put the time in the file. And it should be, if I did a status on it now, it should simply say that, yeah. So it doesn't show an error state. It just says that it's loaded. It's inactive because it ran and exited, which is what the one shot is supposed to do. And it says here that it finished the task, right? I mean, we could reboot the machine, and thanks to your redirect operator, you'll now have two lines in there. Okay. <laughs> Just because you want to be sure, right? I mean, you know, trust but verify, Nate. Trust us, we're All professionals. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Er Eric is always... So supportive as a producer. Sounds like we're getting some comments that it needs to be a little bigger. So I made it a little bigger. Yeah, thank you. OK, now. Did it? I don't think. Did it not run? Why didn't it run? All right, so obviously something went wrong. It didn't run it at boot when it was supposed to. Enabling it should have done it. Start it. Did it run and just not, did it overwrite the file? Did temp get wiped and it just overwrote the file? I don't remember what the time was before we rebooted it. <laughs> uh, it was, well, you ran it and it appended a, a new entry, right? So I, I ran it, it now and it appended, but at reboot, did it clear temp is what I'm wondering. Uh, no, because I think that it ran at 1620. Will we try one more time? <laughs> Um, notice okay. that in your status, it did not say that it had finished the job like it did earlier, which yeah. is why I think it's actually not kicking off at uh, at boot. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's from your just now start. Yeah, now it did because I started it just now. Twenty one. Um, huh. Is your once not accurate? Is the what once? Because um, you wanted it to be run by the multi-user target. But... Ah, multi-dash user. Sorry, I, I saw that earlier and meant to ask about it and, and neglected. He even 
even when you copy and paste. Okay. Now I guess we'll reboot again. Or do I need to re-enable it? Maybe. Yeah, see there, it linked it into multi.user.target. It made a target. <laughs> it made a target for the typo instead of telling me it didn't exist. <laughs> there you go. See, it was just doing what you told it, Nate. Exactly yep. what you told it. All right, now if I... This is why our robot overlords will fail. Yeah. Okay, now I, I feel better because there's other services in the target. <laughs> I feel like I got it right. <laughs> One more time. It's a good thing we didn't have a whole lot of demos for today. This uh, heating up the time that uh, that we would have been like, yeah. And so, what else can we do? <laughs> so, um, I think after this, we should now see three entries in our booted file. Hopefully. Most Remember, the last one was at 421.02. <laughs> yeah. This, this is why we actually did the reboot, Nate, because, uh, you know, it all looks right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is, this, is, and, this is good. Yeah, it's not right. tested, and then it doesn't work when you expect it to work. So there, there we go. go. Now it worked. So back to the original point, if you don't typo the target that it's going to up oh, there's scott with his fireworks and if you don't uh put the unit type in the wrong declaration <laughs> it works totally as designed <laughs> right uh, so nate you also want to talk to us today about uh converting an existing init script because somebody might yeah. have an older software or something that they've gotten from another operating system maybe um that you want to make into a unit file. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about what init scripts used to look like. I don't know if there's anybody here that hasn't delved into one, maybe they've used them and never really seen what was under the covers. Uh, but it's a great like comparison here. So we're going to look at, I have a, a template of a unit file, sorry, of an init D uh, file. It be script. And, and people may run into this. There are a couple of Linux distributions that still use init, but a right. lot of Unixes still use init. So um, right. if you're looking at Solaris or HPUX or AIX, you'll probably end up seeing uh, init out there. Right. Now, I've been system administratoring since, um, since init D was the default, right? And I have to be honest, I never did a lot of work in the init scripts because they're complicated. Like there's a lot going on in here. And if you have a sufficiently complicated service, it gets even harder. Now, in essence, an init script is a bash script that's wrapped up in a case statement, or maybe it's the other way around, and a bash script that runs a case statement. And the case statement is the commands that you would be passing to the service, start, stop, restart, reload, status, things like that. And what I'm showing here on the screen is a very bare bones template file that I found um, that you could use to create an init script, right? Now, this looks simple enough, right? You've got a case, you've got start, you've got stop, you've got restart, reload, and your commands that you wanna run go in here, right? Simple, right? Until you look at an actual, uh, file, an actual script, which I have, uh, again, I just pulled an example. And so, so this is, this is a script that would actually do a thing. Okay. And you see, there's a bunch of environment variables that are declared. There's um, functions that are pulled in from the init B functions library. There's this config config pulled in, right? So there's pieces all over the place. There's some variable set. There's a lock file that you have to deal with. It's not dealt with by the init system itself. You have to kind of call it and point at it and poke at it and do the things. You can see here that it's running your thing in a command called 
Damon tells it where the PID file is supposed to be. Um, I mean, I'm just having trouble finding the line where it tells it what to run, right? I guess it's Damon is the thing that it's running. Um, you have to you have to account for everything. You have to account for where the PID file is. How do I stop the service? Right, that's a script you have to write. It's not just it's not handled for you. It doesn't just kill it. It has to find the PID file. It has to know how to then stop the uh, the service. Right, and then at the bottom here is actually just the logic about okay, what do, what do I do when I pass in the different commands? So the point why I'm showing you this, I can't run this because I don't have a system that's running in it. It's running system D, obviously. Uh, but I want to show this to you just to basically outline the, the complexity that goes into this. Now, you saw me make a unit file before. Um, I'm going to make another one to run a service, right? And it's going to have similar typos in it because I used the same, <laughs> the same template to make them both. But we're going to fix them as we go this time because now we know what we're doing. Uh, we're going to make a myService.service. We're going to paste this in, and we're going to change multi.user.target to multi-user.target because we already know that's a problem. Now, um, this, let me see if, if I save this, come back in. Does it give me syntax? It doesn't. Oh, well. I was hoping it would give me the syntax highlighting so it'd be easier to read. All right, so what this is doing is we give it a unit description, again, just like we did before with that one with that on boot service. The service itself, we get to define what it calls to start. Now, with the old uh, initd script, you could have a whole bunch of logic in here that would make it do different things or make it do things based on the state that it was already in. Uh, System D handles a lot of that for you. It checks to see, like, is the thing already started? Is it, is it running? Is it dead? That kind of thing. And you don't have to think about most of that. Same thing with tracking your PID. Same thing with like, what happens when I restart? Well, there's some basic commands in there that tell it like the, the base of how you would deal with a, with most services when you tell it to restart or when you tell it to stop. You don't have to worry about any of that. However, there is flexibility that says, I want it to run a specific thing before it starts. I want it to run a specific thing when it stops, that sort of stuff. And there's commands for that. There's an exec pre-start, I think it's called. There's an exec post start, which will basically run right before the service starts and right after the service starts. There's an exec stop that will tell it what to do when you tell it to stop the service. So if your service has some special tasks that need to occur when you stop it, you could make a bash script that would then do those things and call that as the stop, right? So this isn't necessarily how to convert a script, but it is, in my opinion, a cleaner way to move your service from the old style into system D. Right, you start with a template similar to this, and then you work out from there. And there's different and service types. We sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and one of the big things that SystemD provides is the uh, ordering and dependencies. Right, so right. in the old world, you had like a number, and your script was executed in its sequence of numbers. Um, and so, oftentimes, what you ended up doing was putting uh, checks into your service management to see if something else was running or if something else was available that your thing fired. Because you couldn't necessarily be sure that somebody hadn't changed the ordering of stuff or that that right. thing hadn't run a boot. Um, but with systemd, thanks to the you know wanted by or requires, um, we're able to kind of have a better idea of what has happened on the machine when our thing is going to fire off. Um, and then as Nate mentioned, like, yeah, process ID tracking and some of the stuff that you kind of always put into your init script is just provided by systemd natively. Right. Right. And the other nice thing is um, systemd has built in functionality for modifying these. If you do a system CTL edit on the, on a service, instead of editing the unit file that came out of the box with the RPM, it makes something similar to like a conf.d file where it will append the changes you've made to the existing unit file. And the changes you made will essentially replace the, the stuff that comes out of the, the unit file. So if I were to do a system CTL edit on this, for example, after it was defined and everything, and I changed exec start, 
it wouldn't go back to my original file and change exec start. It would replace it with this extra file, right? Which I think is actually really handy because if you need to undo your changes, you just remove them and boom, you're back to the basic, back to the start. Uh, you don't have to like version control or save your, uh, your, your work uh, in, in some other you know, external mechanism. All right, so um, I was going to talk about the different types of services. I didn't define one here. I think it defaults to simple. You can look at the man page for system D to find out what the different types are. There's different types for like, well, there's one shot like the one we showed earlier where it runs and exits. Uh, simple, I think, is just a service that starts and stays running. Uh, there's one for forking, which is for one that will start a a process that will then fork out other processes, right? So it can track all of the sub processes. So these are things you're going to want to look into when you're writing your own file, right? They're, they're not, it's, it's not, you, you can't make it this simple for everything, but it's great that you can start with it this simple, right? Which is kind of the point. Yeah. An example right. of forking would be something like web server, because yep. there's like a controller daemon that binds to the ports and there's worker daemons that get spawned underneath of it to actually do the retrieval of content. Right. So at this point, uh, we, we, we did this just before. Um, I've copied the file in. I'm going to enable it. This time we're going to check the status of it. My service went into service that's yeah multi user dot target that's the right one this time <laughs> yep <laughs> and if we do a status on it it should say that it's enabled but not running yep loaded but inactive if i were to start it one p and it's also worth noting you don't have to define dot service at the end of all of these or dot target or dot whatevers cuz System D is smart enough to have to use the context to figure out what it is that you're really trying to do. And I believe, um, well, I'm not certain, but I think if two things have the same name, it will actually tell you so. I hope so. <laughs> uh, so if you don't specify an extension, it defaults to dot service. Is that how it works out? Okay. Because I've seen it with targets where if you don't define the dot target, it will still get you where you need to go. It's best to define that stuff if you need to be precise. But if I'm starting a service, you've probably seen a lot of these where it's like systemctl start httpd, for example. That is technically httpd dot service, but you don't have to put the dot service. It'll just assume that. Okay. Yeah. If I do status one of, again. One of the exceptions to that is uh, cockpit.socket. That will complain because right. there is both a service and a socket. Right. Um, so you have to specify dot socket if that's the one you want. Um, I think your dot target made the appropriate extension choice because you're using something like isolate. And right. Isolate is working with dot target type units. Right. Um, and just to like throw back, if you're interested in what type of units are out there and how they work, our previous episode was on the six different unit types or system D. Right. All right, and just to show that, I'm going to lop off the dot service, and this should give me the same status, right? There it is. You can see that it's running now. Um, all th This is the service you may recall from a previous episode where it just, in a loop, will run the date and time and throws it into the journal, right? So that's exactly what this is doing here. You can see it says the time is 16.35.05, 15, 25, 35, because it runs every 10 seconds. All right, so uh, in a nutshell, that's that's basically what you would do. Now, I believe you can take a initd script, and you could like shim that into a unit file by calling the script and saying start or stop, right, <laughs> as the exec start and the exec stop. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that unless you have a really complicated init uh, file. I would not. And even still, I would figure out what the file, what the old script is doing and convert it to the proper system D syntax, not just shim it in there. Because you know, what could go wrong, right? Like how, how could that ever come back to bite you? <laughs> right, exactly. Let's, let's build in tech debt of our thing. Yeah, yeah. So 
Uh, I know we said converting files and I didn't convert it. I just made a new one because I think that's the right way to go about it. Maybe there's tools out there that'll convert for you, but I have trouble believing that they would be very accurate because of all of the options that you could use, all the things you could have done in the old init scripts um, that are now handled for you by system D. I just can't imagine a good, a good ratio of success <laughs> from a script that actually converts them. Yeah. When, uh, when I've seen this happen, especially in like, we released RHEL 7 as an example, because that's when system D became a thing. Um, most people ended up just writing a simple unit file like Nate did. And then as they discovered things, they enhanced that unit file with whatever other weird things they had to account for with their service. Um, right. But generally just simple unit file was all they needed because it did all the PID tracking and a variety of other things automatically. I think the the key, if you're doing it that way, is to understand if you need to use something other than a simple service type. If you know the thing you're running is, for example, going to fork out more processes, you should use a forking type, right? Fair enough. Well, Nate, uh, it looks like we're at the end of our time together. Uh, I don't see any are. additional questions in the chat. So next episode, Nate, what are we doing next episode? Uh, it's... It's 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 everybody's favorite non-controversial topic, right? Text That's right. editors. So we're going to talk about Vim and just Vim and just Vim, all the Vim, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it is the best editor of all. Uh, of it is. <laughs> uh, but we'll give we'll give some more balanced coverage, I think, and then also like the learning curve for both Vim and Emacs is can be difficult. So there are a couple other easier editors that come with the distribution that if you're starting with it, you're not really sure about text editors that you can get going on. Um, maybe maybe yes. the whole show will just be, we'll open up Emacs and try to figure out how to do anything. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, like writing a, a, a one-shot service and figuring <laughs> it out. <laughs> uh, no, so join us next time as we talk about... Uh, text editors, which is one of the most right. critical of system administration skills here on Into the Terminal. Uh, and then indeed, uh, we, we recently finished up our 10 episode uh, modernizing management techniques with RHEL miniseries. So if you've not seen that with Mr. John Spinks and Eric Hendricks, uh, I recommend you go check it out. And I think that'll bring us to a close. So Nate, any parting words of wisdom? Uh, don't use RC local. <laughs> Mine would be, so you made a thing, verify it before you walk away from it. You made a thing, verify it before you go on live stream to tell people how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Until next week. Happy into the terminal. Yep. Have a good one.